Savior's name. I have a witness bright and clear since I have been redeemed, dispelling every doubt and fear since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed, where I shall live eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated for just a minute. Glad you braved through the stormy weather. Tell you what, it was rough out there. But uh, I heard Adrian Rogers preaching one time, and he said that he and Joyce, it's about 5 o'clock in the morning, they both woke up to a, a clash of thunder and lightning, and, and it just shook the windows of the house and all that, and it started raining, and, and uh, uh, he said, Joyce rolled over and said, Adrian, you hear what that was? And he said, what was that? And he, she said, that was 10 Baptists that aren't going to go to church this morning. And so... <laughs> They say that one drop of Baptist keeps ten, or ten, one drop, one drop of Baptist, one drop of rain will keep ten Baptists out of church. But I'm glad you braved through it. And uh, I've learned one thing about living in Georgia. If you don't like it, just wait about 15 minutes. The sun will start shining and blue skies will come out. And uh, I like that. But uh, let's go ahead and pray and ask God to help our service tonight. Heavenly Father, we sure thank you uh, for allowing us to be together. Thank you for those who are able to come out tonight. I pray that you would help us as we look into your word, that you would give us exactly what we need. And Lord, we'll trust your word and your Holy Spirit to do the work that needs to be done in our hearts tonight. 
I pray you would bless our choir, the special music, all those who uh, are serving tonight. I pray you would empower them and help them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, let's all uh, not stand, but turn to page number 234. I know whom I have believed. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me He hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for His own. But I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart. Now how believing in his word brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the day. I know not how the Spirit moved convicting men of sin, revealing Jesus through his word, creating faith within but I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the fell with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And you may be seated.
will never lose its power. Two fifty three. One seventeen. Let me turn there right quick myself. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my weary is vain. Living by faith. In Jesus above, trusting, confined in, in His great love. From our home safe, in His sheltering arms, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. The tempest may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of light. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. I'm never alarmed. Living by faith in Jesus above. Trusting, confined in, in his great love. From our home safe in his sheltering arms, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. I know that carry me through no matter what evil betides why should I then care though the tempest may blow even living by faith in Jesus above <clears throat> trusting confide in his great love from our home safe in his sheltering arms I'm living by faith and feel no alarm our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day our troubles will then all be o'er. The master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding, his great love from our home safe in his sheltering arms I'm living by faith and feel no alarm Amen you can be seated we're going to have our ushers come forward get ready for our offering There we go. They're coming. Uh, next Sunday, we have Vision Sunday. I want you to be here. Uh, check on people. Make sure they're going to be in their place. And uh, some things I want to sh talk with you about uh, is uh, some numbers that we've had last year, what we're coming into. 
and set some goals for this coming year. I have a different idea about goals many times. A lot of times I will um, maybe set a goal more for, instead of let's see if we can get this many people in church and this many people saved and this many people you know, present, my goal is trying to set work goals and leave the results up to God and say if we can get this many people serving, this many people working, this many people being soul winners, we'll really leave the results up to God. I think we could say, well, let's pray we have 50 new people coming to church next year, or this year, I should say. Well, what if God wants to do 65? You know, I mean, uh, we don't want to limit God with that. So uh, I'm going to set some work goals that I'm going to try to present to you next week. So be ready for that. I'm looking forward to it all. Uh, let's go ahead and pray over the offering. Brother Charlie, it looks like you're the only usher. Uh, so if we need to walk through like five times to get a good one, we need it. So uh, <laughs> we'll let you persuade them however you feel led of the Lord to do so, all right? Safely, safely. Let's pray and ask God to bless the offering. Amen. Thank you.
Tim Foltz is going to have to watch out. Brother Terry's going to take his place. <laughs> You're not tall enough. There's no height requirement for a bass singer. That's for sure. First Kings chapter 19. We'll be back there tonight. Let's find our place there in the Bible tonight, if you would. First Kings chapter 19. We went through the first four verses. We're going to look at those again for just a minute to introduce what we're going to talk about tonight. First Kings chapter 19. Aren't you glad to know that the Bible is sufficient? Yes, it's enough. It is enough, and I'm thankful for it. First Kings chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, Let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Them are the prophets that Elijah had killed before. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose, did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Isn't it amazing? I like that verse 8. When God fed him and restored him physically, he went 40 days on that strength. It's amazing what God can do with that. If he can multiply a little boy's lunch and feed 5,000 men beside women and children, I think he can take that food and water that he had and, and give him strength and energy to go on uh, in that, in that uh, energy and that strength uh, for as long as he needed to for what God had him to do. I like that. But I want you to notice in verse 7, the one phrase I want you to get tonight. And I told you, I hope you read this and at least thought about it. Verse 7 says at the very end of it, the journey is too great for thee. There's too much. It's too big. It's too hard. It's too difficult. There's just too much. The journey that you're on is too great for thee. I'm glad it didn't say it's too much for God but it is too great for thee. And that's what I want to show you tonight. Earlier on, we talked about this a little bit this morning, but earlier on in verse 4, Elijah cried out to God and said, it is enough. You ever feel like it's, it's just enough? I, I, that's, that's all I can take. It's enough. No more. Sometimes when my kids were really little, they'd be acting up and being naughty and disobeying, whatever, and say, all right, that's enough. That's enough. My dog brings me his ball all of the time. <laughs> Diesel never runs out of energy when it comes to a ball. He has a very, very strong drive for that ball. He'll bring me the ball, and I'll give him a hand signal. I'll say, that's enough. And he'll take the ball, put it in his mouth, give me the puppy dog eyes, look down, look up like that. And he'll just look at me for about five seconds, then he'll sigh and walk off every time he does that. He gets a bad attitude. But... Uh, uh, here he is saying, Lord, it's enough. I can't handle anymore. Elijah says it's enough, and God tells him the journey is too great for thee. He understood. He understood what he, could, what he needed, what was going on. I think we get to the point in our lives, in our Christian life, uh, living for the Lord and trying to do his will and, and stay faithful to him and our service and, and our walk with him. I think we become self-sufficient many times. We go in our own strength, and then we finally get to the point and say, it's enough. That I just can't do it anymore. And God says, I know the journey's too great for thee. I'm glad he didn't just leave it there, though. He did something for him. He helped him. I want to talk to you tonight about the journey being too strong and too great, too difficult for you, because let's be honest, the Christian life is a supernatural life. 
It takes supernatural power to live it, and we need that. So you, technically, it is too great for us. But we have a God that will never ask us to do something that he will not empower us to do. He always gives us his power to do so. This journey that we're talking about in our life, the journey uh, it has detours. And you think about Elijah's life, and you think about those kinds of things. You think about your own life. Uh, we have detours in our life that we don't often like. I'll be honest, when I'm traveling, I want to get there as fast as I can. I usually don't take a scenic route. I don't like doing that. I don't like taking the back roads all the time. I want to get there as fast as I can. I don't like taking a detour on roads I don't know, and it's not on the map, it's not on the GPS, and, and it's not registering with where we need to go. It takes longer than expected, you know, detours. The road that we're on has detours. That journey on life, it, it has detours. That's just the way it is. You get out well on your way. You got things going. Things just start happening and chugging along. And everything's going good. And then God gives you a detour. You didn't know about it. You didn't expect it. And sometimes it seems like, and please hear what I said, it seems like God interrupts our plans in our lives. It seems like it, that God does that. The journey of life always has detours, but let me tell you, those detours, I want you to get this, they are divine appointments. They are divine appointments. Life is full of disappointments, heartache. It, life is full of that. So why do there have to be so many detours? Why is it that my plans and your plans, they get sidetracked and detoured and set on the shelf and things don't seem to work out sometimes the way we want? I think it's because God's trying to remind us you can't do this in your own strength. The journey is too great for you. It's too much. So I want to remind you that when God does set a plan for our lives, and he puts us on a journey, and we realize the journey is too great for us, we need to realize that God charts a better plan than we do. God is always at work. You never know what he's doing, but he does. His plans are better than what we can do. It has detours, but the journey also, it says... Uh, it, it tells us that the journey is too great for us. It talks about a day's journey. I talked about that this morning in verse 4, but he himself went a day's journey. Now, we don't talk like that. We don't say, well, how far did you travel a day's journey? Is that flying? Is that on a train? Is that on a horse? Is that walking? Is it in a car? How fast is your car? How were you breaking the speed limit? How long is the day's journey? A day's journey is different. It doesn't mean the same thing. Now we talk about how many, how many hours did it take you to get there? How, how far do you live from church? Well, I live, you know, I live nine miles from church, or I live, you know, 45 minutes from church, or whatever it may be. That's how we talk. But God doesn't measure our lives in miles and minutes and hours. He measures it in days. That's how he measures our journey, is by days. You know, you can figure out how many days you've lived, Right? They say the average lifespan is 25,520 days. 25,520 days, average lifespan. You can measure how many days you have spent, but you don't know how many more you have. We have no idea, so I believe God can say this. You don't have one single day to waste. You waste a day, you're wasting your life. You waste time, you're wasting your life. Don't do that. Every day you have on this journey is an opportunity to prove his strength. Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Luke chapter 11. He said, when you pray, pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He goes on. He says, give us this day our daily bread. God measures it by days because yesterday's faith and yesterday's grace has expired. That's why his mercies are new every morning. He gives you fresh faith, fresh grace, fresh mercy, fresh strength every day because that's how God measures our lives or by our days. So what are you going to do with your day? How will you spend your day? How will you invest your day? tomorrow, the rest of this evening? How are you going to spend that day for the Lord? I think a lot of people think that we're going to accomplish something for God when things get a little bit easier, when things slow down, when things start falling into place. Uh, I know a lot of young people think God's, I want to do God's will, but God's will is, you know, what does he want me to do with my life, and what does he want, who does he want me to marry, and who, what does God have for my life in the future? God's will is never future. It's always right now in the present. It's not some distant goal or some distant future day that may never come. It's in the present right now. 
we have to realize that this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. He's given us a day to live for him. We need to go in that strength. The Bible says in verse 5, here he is. He said, Lord, it's enough. Take my life. I'm not better than my father's. Verse 5, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, verse 6, so he looked, behold, there was a cake baking in the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink. And the angel of the Lord, in verse 7, the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him. I want you to know that this journey, it does have detours. Uh, this journey is measured in days, but this journey also has some delights. It really is. Uh, look, you're looking at a guy right now. If you're looking at me, you're looking at a guy right now that can be as pessimistic as the best of them. I can hang with the most difficult, pessimistic, downhearted people that God ever created. I can, I can be right there on that level. I don't care who they are. I'm just being honest with you. But one of the things that I have to remind myself intentionally on purpose is that this journey we're on, it is delightful. It is delightful. There are difficulties and there are detours, but it is delightful. Let me give you the practical, and then I'm going to go to something spiritual in a minute. Look, verse 5 says, And as he lay and slept, these are some of the delights that God gave Elijah. He slept. God let him sleep. Sleep and rest is one of the great gifts of God. It really is. Um, and I'm not talking about laziness. I'm talking about refreshing yourself and living in such a way that causes you to be refreshed so you can live for God and serve God one more time and serve God for another day. I, I, that's what we're talking about. It's a gift from God. Verse 6 says, uh, uh, towards the end of the verse, and he did eat and drink. Another thing that God did for him, he caused him to eat. Can I just say this? We are spirit, soul, and body. It's called the trichotomy of man. There are three parts. We were, God said, let us, in Genesis 1, 26, let's make man in our image. One of the ways he did that was there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We are spirit, soul, and body. He made us in his image. The spirit and the soul and the body, stay with me, they're so connected, so closely connected, sometimes I think things cross over. Don't, don't think I, don't weird out on me thinking, what did he just say? It's like this. You ever in your soul and your heart just get so stressed and so worried and so anxious? You ask any doctor or counselor or anybody like that, they'll tell you that stress can cause stomach ulcers. That's physical. I think the soul and the spirit and the body sometimes cross over. They affect each other. They affect each other. So God's telling him here, he said, Elijah, I know in your spirit, in your soul, in your inner man, you're discouraged. You're, I mean, let's be honest. He was suicidal in verse 4. But God came to him and he said, I want you to sleep and I want you to eat. And that wasn't enough. The Bible says he did it again. He touched him. And he said, do it again. He ate and he slept more. I think sometimes we need to realize that uh, sometime, I, was, I was talking to a, a, a man a few months ago. He's an assistant pastor, and I talked to him on the phone for a couple of hours. He was just really struggling and uh, just, just having a hard time in his ministry and stuff, and he called me and asked me for some help and counsel on some things, and so I asked him. He didn't think I was, he thought I was going to say, you know, Jesus is enough. And may I say, I'm going to get that Jesus is enough. But I asked him, I said, are you exercising at all? He's like, uh, No. I said, are you eating right? Well, we just eat what we can. It's okay. I said, how much sleep are you getting at night? Oh, I'm so stressed, I can't sleep at all. I said, well, that's probably 80% of your problem right there, if not more. You're not taking care of yourself. Uh, I, I have learned that you have to take care of that sleeping and that eating and taking care of things. But look at what God did for him, verse 6. It says that he looked when he woke up says, and he looked, and behold, there was a cake, bacon on the coals. It was fresh bread. It was fresh. It wasn't stale. It, was, it had just finished baking on those coals. 
God gave him fresh things to help him. And then the Bible says that there was a cruise of water at his head. He didn't have to go far for it. God gave him what he needed. It was at hand. I'm glad to know in the Philippians, the Bible, I think it's chapter 3, uh, Paul said that the Lord is at hand. I'm glad to know that our Savior is right there. He's not distant from us. Let me tell you, you are as close to God as you want to be. You are as, clo as close to God as you want to be. He's right there. <laughs> but would you notice this? <laughs> Look at who came to him. Verse um, 5. I think this is very interesting. And as he lay asleep under a juniper tree, behold, then, what are the next two words? Say it out loud for me. An angel. An angel. I'm not trying to get too grammatical tonight, but I believe the Bible has to be interpreted properly grammatically. It says an angel. That is an indefinite article. It's not the angel. It's just, just an angel. Not identified, just an angel. An angel came to him. But I love this. Verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time. You realize whenever you see in the Old Testament the angel of the Lord. You know who that is? That is Jesus Christ, the angel of the Lord. I'm glad to know that when I'm downhearted and I'm discouraged and I'm depressed and I feel like Elijah, and when you feel like Elijah, because none of us are exempt from that. No, I would say Elijah is a better man, excuse me, than probably any man in this room. When's the last time you called down fire from heaven? Excuse me, most of us would have a very hard time standing in the face of 850 men that are, I believe, demon-possessed. The actions they were committing on that altar on Mount Carmel is a, is a classic sign of demon possession, self-mutilation, cutting themselves, dancing around, jumping around like lunatics. And here's one man. He didn't just stand against them. He mocked them. He mocked them. Now, every man would sit there and say, I would love to do that. But how many of us would have the guts to do that? That's, that's tough. Now, we can sit in the safety of our own echo chamber here and say, yeah, I'd do that. Let's see what would happen if you actually had to do it. I mean, Elijah was a great man, and he still fell prey to this problem. God gave him fresh bread and gave him fresh water. It was right there accessible to him. And then Jesus himself came to him. You know, you've got to take care of the physical, but you also have to take care of the spiritual. You have to take care of both. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness and neither shadow of turning. You know, God's greatest, or excuse me, the greatest delight that God gave to Elijah was not that bread and that water, it was himself. And the greatest treasure and the greatest delight that God gives you is himself. It's himself. Our greatest delight will only be found in the presence of God. If, let me just stay, stop and say this on a side note. If, you're, if you don't have that time when you enter into the presence of God every day, you're going to live under the juniper tree. Hey, I know what that's like. And once you get under that juniper tree and you're all hunched over and you're sitting there and you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're having a pity party and you're just, you're just done with everything, it is enough and you're done, it's real hard. I'm going to be real honest. It's real hard to get into the presence of God in that state of mind. It just is. If you've never been there, you have no clue what I'm talking about, but I know that many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's hard to do that. But it's where we need to be. If we'll just live in that, it will help prevent a lot of that problem. Number four, this journey that we're on requires direction. It requires direction. Look at verse 9, if you would. We're going to read several verses. You follow along with me. 
And the Bible says that he came thither unto a cave. Remember, he's, he's traveled. He's gone for 40 days and 40 nights in that strength that God gave him. And he came thither into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth. And you know this passage. He said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains. I want you to notice that the Lord passed by. When God passed by, there was a strong wind that rent the mountains. It broke the mountains. Rocks broke off the mountains because of that. And breaking pieces of rocks, uh, broke in pieces of the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Can I tell you something? God used the fire and the wind and the earthquake. He used those things, and God will use that in our lives. I think it's interesting, but those are the things that were the result of God passing by. God passed by, wind earthquake, fire. That was the result of God being there. But God was not in those things. I think we get, sometimes we get um, distracted with wanting the results of God instead of just wanting God. He wanted, uh, let's be honest, if I was sitting on that mountain and there was a wind that came and literally broke rocks off the mountain, I would think, man, God is in that tornado. There is no doubt about it in that whirlwind. I, I, I believe if I would have stood there and there was an earthquake and, and, and fire was coming, like lightning coming down, striking and breaking things off, I think, Lord, I hear you. What do you want me to know? We like those kinds of things. That's big and powerful. We like it. But you know what you need when you're in the, in the state of mind that Elijah was in? You don't need the fire and the wind and the earthquake. You need the Lord. The Lord was not in those things. But then a still, small voice came. We need to hear from God. Romans chapter 10. Oh, what is that? It's verse 15 or something like that, I think it is. So with faith cometh by hearing, right? And hearing by the word of God. That hearing and hearing the word, it's not just the written word, though I believe we get what I'm going to tell you from that. Uh, I believe that's the only place it comes from. It's getting a word from God. It's a message from God. It's God speaking to me, which we get from the word of God and in the word of God. That's where it comes from. But what we need to grow our faith and to hear from God is we don't need the big, heavy things in that moment. What we need is that still, small voice to comfort and give hope and give direction and help us. The journey requires direction Verse 13, and it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. He stood at the mouth of the cave, and behold, there came a voice to him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? He already heard that question. He already answered that question. He just answered it. Verse 10. So, he said, verse 14, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord. God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Verse 10 and verse 14 are the same. And the Lord said in verse 15, The Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. He said, I want you to go from where you're at this Mount of Horeb, the mountain of God, the Mount of Horeb. And he said, I want you to go somewhere else. I'm going to send you 140 miles to Damascus. Now, he thought a day's journey of 18 miles was something. Now, it's God, now God has something bigger for him and harder to do. He's fasting for 40 days. He's traveling 140 miles 
You know, what's interesting, there are only three men in the Bible that's recorded for us that fasted for 40 days. Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. Those are the only three that appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration. We don't like that fasting thing, do we? I mean, look at me. I don't like it. All right? You can look at me and tell I don't like fasting. But I've done it several times. Remember, Lord, we tried to cast out those demons. We did it in your name. But they wouldn't listen to us. He said, this kind only comes by prayer and fasting. You know, the Bible, or excuse me, Damascus may not mean that much to us right now, but it meant a whole lot of, to Elijah when he said, I want you to return and go back to the wilderness of Damascus. I don't know maybe what was in his mind when he heard that. He had him, he's going to, he's going to have him anoint a king over Syria to do this. He's going to put him right back in God's work. He didn't put him on the sideline just because he had some depression and discouragement and hardship. He put him right back where he needed to be, serving God after he helped him. But you know what? He had to go to Damascus because that's exactly where he just came from. You know, when he ran and he, well, he, he ran those 18 miles and beat the chariot and all that, he was near Damascus. He sent him back where he didn't want to be. He sent him back to where he ran from. You know, we think we, we set our path, we set a direction for our path, but really, in, in all truth and reality, God does that. He gives us those things. Why would God use that, um, I missed it here. Why would God send the strong wind, the earthquake, and the fire? I mean, that's a powerful thing. Why couldn't he just skip to, here's the still small voice? For the same reason that he doesn't just use a still small voice with us all the time. Because we're so distracted, we wouldn't hear him. Sometimes he has to get our attention. And that's what he was doing with Elijah. He had, to, he had to shake the earth and get his attention and move all the other distractions, get his eyes on God. He had to get him quiet, standing in awe of God so he could hear that voice. You know, that direction that God gave him. Elijah, I think, fell into the same problems we fall into. He said he ran 18 miles to be the chariot. He goes and, and, and goes to this cave, and he stands there and has this conversation with God. He was at Mount Horeb. It's also called the Mount of God in Israel. It's where God met with a lot of people. I, I wonder, I think Elijah probably thought where he was going, what he needed to do was to get to that mountain. You know, the direction God gives us is not lead us to a mountain or to a certain place or geographical place. The greatest direction God gives us always leads us to himself. I was called to preach when I was 13 years old. Back up. God called me to himself, and the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin when I was eight years old, and I trusted Christ as my Savior. That's the first time I heard God's voice as far as speaking to me, drawing me, convicting me, and convincing me of my sin. I got saved when I was eight, five years later when I was 13, in my daily just Bible reading at home, no, no, no big service or teen camp or anything. I was just reading my Bible at home at 13 years old, and God called me to preach from Philippians chapter 3. I'll never forget it. And God spoke to me. A while later, I can remember times God was dealing with me about uh, different things in my life and, and, and was speaking to me, and I remember those callings of God. You know, the greatest calling in a Christian's life is found when Jesus Christ came to his disciples and said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. God's calling Listen, we, we misunderstand it. God's calling is not to a geographical location. God's calling, the greatest calling in our life is to Jesus Christ. That's what we need to get to. Look over at 2 Kings chapter 2. Let's skip ahead in the story just a little bit. All the way after calling Elisha to be his assistant and train him to be the next ma uh, major prophet that God would use, all the way, I would like to say, the easiest way would be to say that 
the end of Elijah's life, but Elijah's life never ended. Elijah, I guess we could say the end of his time on this earth. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, And it came to pass as they still went on, this is Elijah and Elisha talking. Elijah, of course, is older. Elisha, younger. They're talking. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder. Here's, here's some Bible trivia that will correct some questions that you'll read. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind. The chariot of fire didn't take Elijah to heaven. A whirlwind did. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. I want you to notice that he went up to heaven. This journey has a destination. It has a destination. And can I tell you, the Bible says it took him up. It took him up to heaven. Uh, it, it took him uh, by a whirlwind up. The destination for the child of God is always up. It's always up. You might think right now your life's in a downward spiral. I know a lot of people... Oh, I know a lot of people, they get so anxious, so upset, so downhearted, so fearful, so much. You know what? We're not going to live on this earth forever. You realize that? And we can be glad for that. It would be a horrible curse if we had to live on this world forever. It really would. That would be a horrible judgment and punishment for us to live in this sin-cursed, evil world forever. I'm glad one day I'm not going to be here. I'm looking, for, I'll be honest, I don't really, I'm not looking forward to dying if that's what God wants me to do. I'd much rather be raptured out. I don't want to die. I really don't want to die. But, not afraid of it. Not afraid of it. But I know a lot of Christians, they've attached their affection to this world and things here so strongly that the worst thing they think could ever happen to them is they, they would die. Can I tell you? Death is nothing more than a door that opens up so we can walk into heaven. That's it. That's it. The destination for a believer always ends in heaven. It always does. And let me just say this. When we get to our destination, which is heaven, when we get there, now let's use a little bit of sanctified imagination for a minute, okay? I'm not saying this is the way it's going to be, but let's just... Put it where we understand it. Kind of like saying, I, I got a mansion just over the hilltop. That's not scriptural. Just over the hilltop. I believe there are mansions there, but I don't think it's going to be just over the hilltop. Uh, but uh, let's use an imagination for a minute. Think about it. When we get to our destination in heaven, I don't believe, Brother Bill, I don't think, I really don't believe that me and you, <clears throat> Brother Terry and Brother Dale and Brother Richards and Brother Charlie, I don't think we're going to get around the throne of God just standing there talking about all those detours in life. I don't think we're going to sit there and say, boy, I tell you what, I was, whew, glad that's over. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be in such awe and such wonder I've had somebody ask me before several times, do you think when we get to heaven, we're going to remember this life? I can't answer that, but I do know this. I think there are some things we, that will be recalled to our memory at the judgment seat of Christ, no doubt. Yeah. has to be. But I believe after the judgment seat of Christ, I believe it's going to be so wonderful being with Jesus Christ. It's kind of like Hebrews 12 says, all the things we face today, I can't, I'm not quoting it, but all the things, the troubles we face today and the chastening hand of God and all the things that we go through in this sinful world are just going to pale in comparison. They are nothing compared to the splendor of glory when we get there. There's a destination. I don't think we're going to be complaining about how tough the journey was. I think we're going to be praising the one who helped us through it. And I'll close with this, just a simple thought. Every trip I've ever taken, I've had to plan for. Every journey I've ever taken, I've had to plan for. Now, some of, I'll be honest, some of the trips I've taken planned on the spot. Done that a couple of times. 
Uh, I can remember one time we were in Indiana. I had just started a church there, and, and uh, we were going to do a Super Bowl Sunday. And uh, we, yeah, my, my family knows exactly where I'm going. Well, here's the thing. Don't get mad at me. I'm not a big sports guy as far as football and basketball and all, keeping up with all that stuff. I don't, I don't really get into it. We had a lot of people in our church that did. So we did a Super Bowl Sunday. I said, I want you to wear your favorite team colors on, you know, this designated Sunday. Well, I don't like the NFL. If I'm going to get anything, I can get into college football. Here we are in Indiana. I started looking on Amazon, different stuff, thinking, man, I need, to, I need to order a UT volunteer shirt or something. Those things are expensive online. I didn't know that. I never bought that kind of stuff. So I started thinking, okay, there's four of us. I have to have one. Andrew has to have one. Abby has to have one. Miss Patty has to have one. That's a lot of money. But I know I could drive to Knoxville, Tennessee, and get them a lot cheaper. So... I came to my wife on Thursday and said, hey, instead of spending money on Amazon doing this and spending all these hundreds of dollars, let's get in the car and just a quick down there and back. It's only seven hours. We'll be fine. Seven hours there, seven hours back, all in one day, leave at like 3 o'clock in the morning, get there at 10 o'clock, eat lunch, drive back home, be back in time for supper. She looked at me and said, what? I don't do that kind of thing. We did it. Except she said, I'm not going to go in one day, but let's just stay the night. So we went, we left on a Friday, spent the, we, we drove around, got our hoodies and all this stuff, and spent the night and came back home on Saturday, and, and I wore my Tennessee orange uh, on Sunday. You know, that was probably the least planned trip we ever did, but there was still some planning. You see, when you're on a journey, you have to make some kind of preparation for it. You have to get ready for it. You have to pack. You have to chart your course. You have to be ready to go. You know, the greatest thing you can do for the journey is to prepare. Are you prepared for the destination? Now, the first way you do that is making sure you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. That's the first preparation anybody makes to make sure that they're ready for the destination is to make sure that Jesus Christ is their Savior, their sins are forgiven, but can I tell you, for the believer, there still needs to be preparation made. You still have to make preparation. You have to realize that this journey is too great for you. You cannot live the supernatural Christian life with carnal, natural power and human power. It's too great for you, but God's strength is great enough for the journey. I want to encourage you tonight, the same God who met with Elijah and brought him through that journey is the same God that will meet with me and you and bring us through our journey as well. He'll do it. He'll do it. Oh, it, there's a lot in a day's journey. He had no idea he was going to travel 140 miles after that, though, on food that he ate twice and live on that for 40 days and 40 nights. But God's strength and power is enough. And I want you to know that it is tonight. It is. Heavenly Father, would you help us this evening? Lord, I'm looking forward to the destination, but Lord, help us to realize that we don't have to just wait for the destination to enjoy it. We can enjoy the journey that we're on today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. How many tonight would say, Preacher, God has dealt with me tonight. I need to make sure I'm enjoying the journey on the road to the destination. I don't, I don't want to just wait for heaven to rejoice in the Lord. I, I know I need to do that now. God dealt with me tonight. I, I need to make sure I practice that in a better way. God's dealt with you. How many of you say, preacher, please pray for me. Just lift your hand in the air for just a minute. Let me pray for you. Yeah, me too. I want you to pray for me on that. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus together. Can we do it? Heavenly Father, I pray for those, including myself in this room. Lord, help us Help us to keep our eyes on the sky for Christ's return. We live in the light, not in the dark. Uh, we are children of the light, not children of the night. Uh, we know that you are coming back. We won't be surprised by it. We know you're coming. But Lord, help us until that perfect, glorious day when we see you. Help us on that path of this journey that you've placed us on. Realize that the journey truly is too great for us. 
We can't bear it. We can't do it ourselves. But you will empower us. Lord, help us to appropriate that grace and power of God in our lives that you've given. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming out tonight. We'll see you Wednesday night. Thank you.